want to introduce uh, Jennifer Rackfield from PhD student from Purdue University. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm a PhD student from Purdue University. I'll be talking about um, anaerobic co-digestion. Uh, my uh, co-advisor, Dr. Jitin Ni, is here as well. This group, probably you don't need a lot of introduction for the, the reasoning behind anaerobic digestion. Um, naturally, there's all kinds of different waste, uh, manure, obviously, so we're talking about a lot, but also there's other kinds of waste, food waste, et cetera, um, that we need to take care of, we need to handle in one way or another. Um, renewable energy is a big deal right now, especially um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and and so forth. And with increasing um, fertilizer costs as well, um, this, this is uh, certainly relevant. Um, however, it needs to be economically viable in order for farmers to be able to adopt it. Um, it hypothetically, it is economically viable, at least in terms of farm size. Um, it, the EPA AgStar estimated uh, approximately 8,000 agricultural digesters that are viable uh, nationwide, but only about 4% of that is currently uses anaerobic digestion. And there's lots of reasons for that. It's anaerobic digestion is not necessarily a one size fits all. Um, it is expensive up front. Um, and there are all kinds of other economic challenges, um, such as selling the energy or the natural gas. Um, however, one of the issues as well is just a lack of, of awareness or knowledge around it. One of the ways that we are looking at addressing at least one small aspect of these economic challenges is by looking at um, trying to research more in depth this the potential for co-digestion, adding in something in addition to manure um, to supplement both in terms of the actual energy produced and whatever whatever economic benefit you're getting from, from the energy, but also possibly in terms of tipping fees, if that, uh, if that byproduct is something that someone else needs to get rid of and it costs them more to get rid of it somewhere besides your digester, then you can make money off of that possibly. Um, in, in addition, in certain circumstances, there is the possibility for improving uh, digester health or stability or just operation. And so we want to try and quantify some of that. Um, there are, of course, still barriers to co-digestion. Um, <clears throat> reliability of feedstocks is always one that that is an issue, which is, again, one reason why co-digestion, even for anaerobic digesters, is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all. This is just a possible tool in the toolbox um, that we want to address. Um, however, because uh, there is some advanced knowledge needed about whether or not a feedstock will be useful in an anaerobic digester and you do not want your digester to fail, um, we're, that, that's where our research comes in in, tr in trying to look at what happens if you add in a, another uh, feedstock and we're, we look at several different feedstocks for that. So one of the biggest things that we're looking at ourselves is whether or not there's um, synergistic or antagonistic effects on either methane yield, how much you're getting out of, of the feedstock at the end of, at the end of its uh, digestion, um, but also in the meantime, how fast does it digest? Is, is there an, in, any kind of interaction effect between those two? So we have so far, this is, this is ongoing research. Um, how, however, so far what we've done is we've conducted two different experiments. Um, they're essentially batch biomethane potential tests, um, although we are using a one to two inoculum to feed stock ratio um, rather than the, the typical two to one um, to be closer to what the, the digester is actually seeing in the field. Um, <clears throat> our first experiment is a was a mono digestion experiment we used eight different feedstocks that are actually being used by the um we're, we're working with a with a farm digester um who is already taking in 
alternative feedstocks. And they were like, we want to know more about these specific feedstocks. And so we, we did a mono digestion test just to see what those look like with, with nothing else, not with manure, not with anything, just inoculum and, and that feedstock. And then we uh, conducted later, um, we wanted to have a, a, a baseline for those. And, and later we conducted an additional co-digestion test where we uh, did a pairwise experiment with several different combinations. And I'll explain that more in a minute. We, these are uh, one liter working volume digesters, mesophilic. Uh, we're collecting gas and gas bags. They're batch experiments. So we just stick them in. They run for about 30 to 30 to 40 ish days. And, uh, and we were doing that in triplicate. So just very briefly, I wanted to show you uh, some of the feedstocks that we were using this, um, this full scale digester uh, that we're working with this farm digester we're working with. Um, they actually have significantly more than this, but these are the ones that they use the most of. And so they said, we want to know what happens when we when we put these in because they had some, they had their own observations, but they had never actually done a test to see what was actually going on. Um, so lots of different things, uh, as you can see here, a lot of um, kind of waste products from industrial, like food grade types of facilities. Um, and this last one that I wanted to highlight, ammonia recovery effluent, uh, this digester company, what they do at the end after they've done their anaerobic digestion, digestion is they do have a method of recovering ammonia um, from, from that digestate. And so then they recycle what's left over back into the digester and they wanted to see what happened with that as well. The co-digestion experiment, we did uh, pairwise combinations of both, uh, mostly of manure, um, because that's what they have the most of. They are a, a beef farm. Um, so, so mostly we were doing manure and pairwise with five of the feedstocks that looked the most interesting, that have the most interesting characteristics, um, both in uh, one to one ratio and also in a ratio that is approximately proportional to what would be going into the digester if there was nothing else. If you just had manure and this feedstock, what would that look like? Um, and then finally, st starch and stop sock uh, both had very different um, uh, kinetic, kinetic properties. And so we wanted to see what would happen if we just combined those two. So the monodigestion results, the beef manure produced the most biogas, which is not super uncommon. That was kind of what we were expecting. We did have fairly similar results between replicates, um, but we also saw some pretty uh, interesting results with a few of the different feedstocks, some things we weren't expecting. Um, for example, that soap stock, which was pretty high in lipids, it actually had, um, that's that black dotted line. Um, it, it actually uh, experienced three different plateaus, which was a, a little bit unusual. Um, so that was one of the things we wanted to look, look into a little bit more with the co-digestion results. Before I go into more detail with the co-digestion results, the, the first thing I wanted to emphasize is when we ran our co-digestion experiment, one of the things we did is we actually had a set of controls where we did monodigestion over again with the, the new samples because we sampled, we, we took samples in April for the monodigestion test, and then we wanted fresh samples. So we took samples again for the co-digestion test in September, we wanted to make sure that we were getting similar things between the two of them. And it actually turns out we got pretty different things for some of, for some of the, um, of the feedstocks, uh, which is relevant because if you are to do co-digestion tests in the future, you want to make sure that you've got these, um, these controls in there because that, that you could end up with very different results. Um, and we are doing some, some deeper investigations as to why that could be the case. Um, of course, with some of them, we got pretty similar results, but you just never know. So, so you should, you should have those controls. <clears throat> Um, before I go into more detail about uh, with each of the different treatments, I wanted to kind of walk you through what you're going to see in these next several sets of graphs. Um, 
we the the brown line is one of the feed stocks. Um, it, it just the mono digestion control. If it says F one, that means manure. That's mostly what you'll see there. Uh, the gray line is the other feed stock, whatever that was um, in mono digestion. And then the dotted lines are going to be your predictions. And when I say prediction, what I did is for each time point, I took a weighted average yield because for biomethane potential, it's gas per unit volatile solids added. So you're not going to actually see, um, it, you're not going to see doubling, you're, you're going to see a weighted average between them. And so it'll, it'll, those, that's why those dotted lines fall somewhere in between those two mono digestion results. And then the, the points will be the experimental averages. For the manure and starch treatment, um, the, the first treatment here, um, this is actually uh, the, the one with the most variation. Um, so, so the other ones have, uh, have much less variation, but um, as you can see, the, those black lines for, from the equivalent or one-to-one -one ratio uh, treatment of manure and starch on a mass basis, um, it, that black those black points are way higher than uh, than the um, that than that black dotted line, and that is showing both that there is yield synergy between the two. You're getting more methane than you would have out of either of those alone, but also um, from a kinetic standpoint, you're producing that gas faster, um, which can be beneficial in a digester, but it's also something that you need to be careful of um, because you don't want to run the risk of acidification as well. Um, so, <clears throat> so seeing both yield and kinetic synergy, um, there was a lot of variation actually with the manure um, or with the, the proportional um, digester treatments. Um, I don't necessarily have a good explanation for that with anaerobic digestion, there's always going to be pretty significant biological variation, but this is a little bit more than usual. So for this one, we can't necessarily say that um, it conclusively that the, that those treatments were above what was predicted. Um, however, for the other treatments, you'll be able to see that for the most part, it, um, that, that variation was, was much smaller. So manure and slaughterhouse waste, uh, again, both the proportional and the one-to-one -one ratio treatments um, were above the pr those predicted lines, um, those black and orange uh, predicted lines. Um, and for the most part, you saw much more normal uh, biomethane potential curves uh, that sort of First order kinetic is a bit more what you what you would expect for biomethane potential curves rather than that sigmoidal curve that you're getting with the slaughterhouse waste. With the soap stock, this is a little bit hard to see because I didn't put a line through the experimental results just to make sure that it was a little bit clear. Um, but there is a little bit of I don't know, you could call it a, a shiver a little bit. It's not necessarily a huge lag lag in that, um, in those, in that one-to-one, -one, uh, treatment, but it is a, a little bit more delayed than that really smooth, normal, um, first order curve. Uh, so you're, you are seeing that there is going to be some effect from the co-digested sub feedstock, whatever that is. Um, but that, uh, that impact is relatively minimal compared to, compared to what we're seeing, um, elsewhere. Um, manure and filter press slurry as well, um, much closer with the, with the predicted or with the proportional, um, treatment, but again, the one-to-one -one treatment had a pretty, pretty significant, um, increase in, uh, in both yield and kinetic properties. And finally, the starch and soap stock, um, as you can see, the starch all by itself um, uh, reacted very quickly and quite possibly acidified and led to digestion, digestion failure. That could be what we're seeing there, why it um, plateaued so dramatically um, quickly. Uh, but even still, um, with the, when we included the soap stock in with the starch, we saw um, improvements in yield.
than that. So in conclusion, um, we saw more biogas uh, and more methane um, from the beef manure than from any of the other supplemental feedstocks. Um, mono digestion of any of these feedstocks can at times uh, result in large differences um, in, in yield and kinetic performance. So when, we're, when you're doing co-digestion experiments, it's really important to have those monodigestion controls. Just make sure that um, any variations in batches from those feedstocks, even if they seem, even if they look like they're pretty homogenous, and some of the feedstocks that we had looked very homogenous. They looked pretty similar to what we had uh, you know, six months before, but they, they turned out to be pretty different. Um, and overall from the, the experiments that we did, we generally saw some pretty promising, um, synergy between feedstocks in terms of both yield and kinetics, uh, through co-digestion. So in the future, we have, because of this variability that we saw a bit between feedstock batches, um, we're going to make sure that we try to test in a bit more detail um, what that looks like for, for this digester system. Um, we want to delve more deeply into why the synergy is happening. And ultimately, we would like to develop a, a tool that farmers can use um, or anaerobic digester uh, companies can use that um, might give them some insight into what they might be able to expect when they're doing co-digestion or when they're considering doing co-digestion in the future. I'd like to thank our sponsors, especially uh, the USDA SER program, um, and Biotown Ag for, for their help and uh, contributions to samples, as well as uh, the undergraduate research assistants that have assisted. And with that, thank you for your attention. Do we have time for questions or? I have time for one question. Oh, okay. I mean, well, I, I... okay. Any questions? Yes. Yes, I didn't show that here, um, but but that was one of the things that we were keeping track of, which is one of the reasons that there there was some decrease in pH with um, with those starch uh, treatments that that I mentioned, and so I, that's one of the reasons I think there was an issue with acidification.